Good evening and welcome to you all on this rainy night. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here and to welcome our guests, which I shall do in a minute, to tonight's lecture on the future of global capitalism, small topic, convergence or divergence across the world. Uh, this evening's event, of course, is part of the Ralph Miliband Lecture Series, which we're holding all year uh, on this theme of uh, what to make of capitalism now and in the future, particularly in light of the global financial crisis. We're joined this evening by three very distinguished uh, figures um, based here at the LSE, Martin Jakes, who will speak first, Professor Robert Wade, and Professor Michael Cox. Martin Jakes is an award-winning journalist and a columnist for The Guardian and The New Statesman. He's also a visiting senior fellow here at LSE Ideas and a visiting research fellow at the LSE's Asia Research Center. Prior to this, he was the editor of Marxism Today, which was hugely influential in its time, and co-founded the think tank Demos. His latest and most recent, his latest book, and most recent, this doesn't make sense, his latest book is When China Rules the World, The Rise of the Middle Kingdom and the End of the Western World. Pretty serious title. <laughs> Robert Wade is Professor of International Political Economy. Of course, you know him well. He is the author of Governing the Market, Economic Theory and the Role of Government in East Asia's Industrialization, published by Princeton in 2004, and I mention this book in particular because it won the American Political Science Association's award of the best book in political economy, a pretty serious award. Some of his recent papers uh, have focused on trends in world uh, poverty and income distribution, international economic governance, WTO, World Bank, and the ascendancy of neoliberal globalization to global policy status, among other topics. Mick Cox is Professor of International Relations. He's the co-director of Ideas at LSE and director as well here of the Cold War Studies Center. He's spoken to many high-profile audiences across the world, authored many books on international politics, the Cold War, US foreign policy, and superpower behavior. Each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, and then I'll ask them perhaps to comment briefly on each other's contributions, or maybe we'll do that during question time. And then, of course, the floor is yours. Some of you may have been here when I had Professor Zizek last week. It was an incredibly uh, uh, entertaining, uh, uh, funny one hour. So uh, if you were, I'm not sure this panel might rise to that level of humor, but it certainly <laughs> sets the bar for humor quite high. And uh, uh, we'll see how they go. Anyway, well, uh, let's uh, give them a very warm welcome, and thank you all for coming. Thank you very much, David, for those kind words. Um, and uh, I don't know whether what I'm going to say today has got much Marxism today in it, but it's certainly got a bit of China in it. Um, well, a few remarks to set the ball rolling, really. Um, first of all, it seems to me that the global financial crisis uh, marked the beginning in the, of the end of the neoliberal era that started in the late 1970s. Now, I think it represented only the beginning because it was not preceded by a serious challenge to neoliberal assumptions which remained dominant and still largely dominant. Rather, the, the system, in effect, hit the buffers sunk by its own logic. And we've seen uh, how limited the reforms have been, especially uh, in the United States, with the, uh, and also our own country, with the banks largely protected and old ideas and assumptions remaining extremely powerful. The end, because it seems to me that actually the problems of the neoliberal approach as epitomized in the United States and the UK are simply too profound for it to be sustained in the old way, given the sort of problems now being faced. I'm thinking here about American indebtedness, um, but also you know, the sheer illogicality of an argument uh, around moral hazard, uh, that the banks are simply now too big to fail, uh, and aligning that with a free market argument. Now, of course, lapping around the toes in this argument is a serious uh, challenge from the Franco-German camp to the model 
calling for more strict controls uh, on financial institutions, financial behavior, pay of bankers, and so on. But I don't really want to concentrate on this in my short uh, 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 minutes. I want to concentrate on something else which seems to me to have uh, much more devastating implications, uh, which is that, that the reason why, in my view, the neoliberal model will not be sustained in this way is the shift in the global center of economic gravity from the developed to the developing world. The blunt truth is that the importance of the Anglo-Saxon world is in decline, and so is the importance of the developed world, although, of course, that's got a long way to go. But one only has to picture those statistics of what the world might look like in 2025 or 2050, um, with the Chinese economy, for example, being maybe twice the size of the American economy. Bear in mind here also that, uh, contrary to um, journalistic commentary, East Asia never uh, adopted neoliberalism as a economic uh, model uh, in the manner of the Anglo-Saxon world. Now, projecting forwards, um, the question is, what will Chinese capitalism be like? Or what will Indian capitalism be like? Or what will Brazilian capitalism look like? Or is it possible that China can be so neatly categorized? Well, maybe, but only, it seems to me, with very important riders and qualifications. And the question we're faced with here is not so dissimilar from that which emerged increasingly after 1870 if one wanted to understand the emergent world system. What were the distinct, distinctive characteristics of, Europe, of American capitalism in contrast to European capitalism? And what would eventually its global role be? It was rather later, in the 1930s, that Gramsci posed these questions in the prison notebooks, the question of, of Americanism and Fordism. What, would, what were the characteristics of the American mode of production? And of course, what we were looking at was some very new characteristics, or relatively new characteristics. Standardized market, Fordism, in other words, forms of mass production. Um, a lack that, of course, uh, underpinning it, the lack of a pre-capitalist legacy and all the implications that had economically and culturally the emergence, if you like, of a new culture. Now, what in this context might be the distinctive characteristics of China um, and its implications for capitalism? Well, first of all, I think that the most important point I'd start with probably is the role of the state. Now, it's true that since the reforms uh, started in 1978, and in particular since the privatization under Zhu Rongji in the late 1990s, um, the role of the state has diminished. But it's still very pronounced. Uh, it was nothing like what happened uh, in Russia under Yeltsin, and uh, the uh, and it's certainly far more pronounced, not just on the West, uh, but in contrast to the Asian uh, tigers. Privatization has been limited, and if you look at the major companies in uh, China, many of them are state-owned, and those that aren't state-owned often have a very close link to the state. For example, Lenovo, ultimate owner is the Chinese Academy uh, of Science. All the banks, for example, major banks remain uh, state-owned. Furthermore, the way that the state-owned enterprises operate in China is very different from the Western model. They're not constrained. They can, they're free to raise capital on the capital markets. Uh, they're free to uh, invest and, uh, in new areas and so on. Uh, it's a very different kind of model than that, to that which is operated. Uh, in the West. Now, you might say, well, is this a developmental phenomenon? In other words, is it simply historically to do 
with the stage of development economically that China is in, or has it uh, rather something to do with the Chinese state as a more, in, a, in a more fundamental context? Now, I think the answer probably to that is both, but I would lay the stress on the latter rather than the former, the developmental aspect. Um, because the more I've personally thought about the Chinese state, the more I think the way it's constructed, or rather it's the way its relationship with society is constructed, is profoundly different from any uh, Western um, experience. Um, and that's essentially because of its relationship to what I describe as the civilization state and the nature of its legitimacy uh, in society. So I think that it is a different phenomenon, and as a result, it's going to introduce a very different um, element into uh, uh, the global economy and discussions about the global polity. The second element I, 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 is, is something I'll raise. I'm not sure about it myself at the moment, but I think it's very interesting. It's uh, derived from some of the writings of an of a economist at Tsinghua University, uh, Sui Zhuan, and uh, he argues that uh, it's wrong to classify China as simply uh, capitalist, that this is a loose use of terminology, that it's more complex than that, uh, that um, it, it, he, he, he likes to describe uh, China as a, as a form of petty bourgeois socialism. Well, I don't know whether I'd go along with that, but I think his point is important which is that uh, if you look at the forms of um, agrarian uh, ownership of land in the countryside, for example, the agrarian model is based on a household contract system, uh, not on individual ownership, and that's been extended on several occasions, um, including most recently in the 1990s. And likewise, many of the enterprises are based on, in the, in the agrarian enterprises are based on the shareholding uh, contract uh, system and he would extend this argument and say, "Well, look at uh, the forms of ownership and the way that the Shanghai and um, as reflected in the way the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock exchanges work, and the various categories of share ownership, including the, a particular category uh, for state shares." Well, what's the implication of this? The implication of this th is that probably we shouldn't assume um, that China uh, will simply. Uh, become capitalist in the same form, in the same, using the same forms, uh, as has been the case uh, in the West, but it's likely to be rather more complicated uh, than that. Well, there's nothing new in that particularly, because if you look at the way the market system worked in China prior to, for example, 1800, it had many distinctive characteristics, even though it was the most sophisticated market at the time, um, in contrast to the European experience. <coughs> My third point about uh, the characteristic of Chinese um, capitalism, if I can call it that, or the Chinese economy, will be that it will remain for a long time to come, I mean at least another quarter century, um, both a developed and a developing economy. I mean, this, is an ex uh, uh, this is going to be a completely new dimension in the world system. Hitherto, uh, the most uh, advanced economies have always been um, uh, both... Uh, the biggest and the richest uh, in terms of standard living. But this will not be true of China, just as it won't be true uh, of India. Uh, and this will introduce a quite di new mention, uh, dimension. I mean, in the context of, I think, of all developing societies, not just China, the state is a far more prominent uh, element often uh, than it is uh, in the traditional uh, advanced Western world. My fourth uh, characteristic of China, and if we weren't, weren't trying to sort of begin to say, well, what would be the uh, Chinese equivalent uh, of uh, Gramsci's argument around Americanism and Fordism, well, my fourth point would be um, the vastness of China uh, and its implications. Uh, because this is on China is both in demographic and geographical uh, terms. Uh, on a different scale. Well, geographical size, it's roughly the same size as the United States, but of course its population uh, is uh, four times as large. And the way in which that will operate within any, any global system 
uh, uh, will be uh, a completely new uh, phenomenon uh, compared with what we're used to in the past. Uh, my fifth point uh, is um, China's shortage of raw materials or shortage of commodities. The only uh, uh, natural resource that it's got a great abundance of is people. Otherwise, uh, as we've seen over the last decade, it, it, it's uh, uh, been forced uh, to become a major importer of raw materials from uh, many countries and uh, several continents. Now, the con the, the, how that will work um, in the longer run and what sort of relationships it will set up between China um, and other countries, uh, we're still at the most early stages of considering. Um, my fifth point is, um, and it relates to that point, is uh, I think that the historical legacy of the tributary state system um, will be one way in which we will uh, need to understand uh, the nature of uh, the China, a modern China. Um, that, uh, I mean, often uh, when people look at the question of China and Africa, they talk about uh, a colonial relationship. Well, I'm not saying that that is uh, not important. Uh, certainly when it comes to sort of basic question of inequality and so on, uh, then uh, the colonial experience may very, very well be uh, offer something. But the fact is that China uh, has never colonized, uh, even when it had the opportunity to colonize, for example, Southeast Asia. But it did have a very um, organized tributary state system which lasted at least a couple, a couple of thousand years. And so uh, how China will relate to uh, the rest of the world, I think, has to be seen uh, not least through the prism of the tributary uh, legacy. My final point about uh, the characteristics of China, although we can, one can go on and add, is that all of these things uh, add up, it seems to me, to a very new kind of culture. I mean, if American culture that emerged from its dynamic period of 1870 to 1914 uh, was very distinctive from what previously had been true of Europe, then uh, we could say that we ain't seen nothing yet compared in, 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 uh, when we look at the, the rise of China and what, uh, given all its characteristics and so on, uh, what new sort of culture uh, is likely to emerge uh, from a combination of Chinese modernity and uh, Chinese uh, history. Um, and obviously prominent within this are, are two elements that need to be uh, considered. Uh, and again, they add a completely new dimension to any discussion about the future of capitalism. One is the Confucian tradition and the, uh, the, the, what are the most important elements within that, which I think is, is more important than the second point, but I think the second point is also important, which is the force that modernized China successfully was, of course, the communist tradition in its Chinese form, namely uh, Maoism. Um, and without 1949 and without Mao, then today, would have been impossible. Uh, in other words, the agency of modernization in China was 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 uh, a Western tradition in this sense, which is <coughs> communism. Sorry, Martin, it was Martin, can I can you can I give you just two more minutes? Yeah, thanks. But but which was in a, came in a highly indigenized form uh, uh, with Mao. So uh, with those uh, uh, words, I will conclude mm -hmm. with extraordinary <laughs> discipline. Well, um, Martin was uh, rather upbeat in many ways. I'm afraid I'm going to be um, uh, somewhat pessimistic in my line of argument, talking about the future of capitalism in up to, say, 2020, the next 10 years. 
But let me begin by uh, making a comment about the current global crisis. Um, the, most of the discussion about what to do focuses in on the financial system itself uh, in terms of how to get uh, tighter, stronger regulation of financial entities. And then the response to this, coming, to this talk coming from the city, from Wall Street, tends to be, but we on our own can't act until everybody acts, and that of course is a recipe for doing very little. Um, my argument is that uh, in order to stabilize the world capitalist economy, we have to move outside the financial system and look for the deep causes, the causes that is outside the financial system, and think about how to um, reduce some of these deep drivers of financial uh, instability. Um, and so I'm going to be talking about features of the world financial regime rather than the close-in features of how much leverage banks are allowed to carry. Um, and my, my argument then is that this, um, the instability generated by current features of the world financial system, the world financial regime, um, will generate such instability chronically as to overwhelm whatever efforts governments manage to get together in order to regulate finance more closely. Um, it's like uh, a canoe going into an ocean storm. The canoeists are the regulators, but they're facing such large um, forces making for financial instability that they're likely to be overwhelmed. So we need structural reforms. In particular, what we, we need to remember what happened after the East Asian crisis as an object lesson of what to avoid because, just let me remind you, the East Asian crisis beginning in 1997 um, uh, and then extending into Russia, into Latin America, especially Brazil, for the first year or so, this generated real panic in Washington and in London. And there was a lot of talk at that time in Western capitals about how this crisis was going to hit us here and therefore we needed to lead the effort to form a new international financial architecture, which was called NIFA, N-I-F-A. Lots of talk, quite radical talk, about new global organizations, new global regulatory functions, and so on. Then once it became clear that this crisis out there was not going to hit us, all this talk sort of evaporated. And it, that's not to say nothing happened. What did happen was a proliferation of standards, standards of best practice formulated by all kinds of bodies, um, best practice of bank supervision, of corporate governance, of data dissemination, you name it, standards of best practice were formulated. The key point, though, is that these were all voluntary. In other words, no additional restrictions were placed on the operations of financial entities, and this then paved the way for the build-up of the high tech uh, bubble in the United States and for the, um, the flood of liquidity that followed it coming from the US Central Bank, and the build up to this current uh, crisis now. That's what we need to be careful of because that's going to be the response. As soon as it looks like this crisis can be contained, the direction of response will be we need more standards of best practice, but they'll have to be voluntary. And of course, every, to the extent that we go beyond that, everybody will have to agree, therefore we won't be able to do anything. So that's what we need to avoid. Let me talk about um, some of the uh, two of the main drivers, as I see it, the destabilizing features of the present world economy. The first one is weak and eroding, two separate things. Weak and eroding interstate cooperation in both finance and trade, in other words, there is a mismatch problem, a problem that David Held, for one, has written about very eloquently, the mismatch between regulatory capacities anchored in nation states and the global scope of markets in trade and finance. It's been much talked about already. The problem is, I argue, that it's actually getting worse, not better, and that one consequence of this mismatch problem, that is weak interstate cooperation, especially in finance, well, in finance and trade, is that there are persistent global imbalances, 
surpluses, deficits, and that these imbalances are direct drivers of financial instability leading to crisis. That's the, second, the first big driver. The second one is more surprising. I want to draw attention to high and rising income inequality in the West, but especially the United States. And this is the surprising consequence. I want to argue that one consequence is that it hobbles the US ability to lead interstate cooperation in finance and trade. So that's an overview of the argument. Let me just substantiate some of the points briefly about, first of all, weak multilateral governance in finance. The key point is that since the end of Bretton Woods and the emergence of what we call the post-Bretton Woods era, very unsatisfactory term, post-Bretton Woods, but the key point is that in this post-Bretton Woods era, since the breakdown of Bretton Woods, there has been essentially no global governance control over key international financial problems such as exchange rate volatility, balance of payments, imbalances, short-term capital flows dominating long-term capital flows. There's been no locus of governance uh, of these kind of problems. The IMF, which used to be the locus of governance in the Bretton Woods regime, um, in the post-Bretton Woods regime, has come to, be exercise, come to be able to exercise discipline only over the poor and the marginal states like, uh, well, you name them, um, but, but not over the powerful states, certainly not over the Western states and not over China. And you see this, this, uh, the problem of the lack of governance, especially in exchange rates. The exchange rate is the most important price for many economies. Just last week, de uh, Vietnam devalued by 5% because China has been pegged, pegging its exchange rate to the dollar, and the dollar's going down, therefore the Chinese currency is going down against the Vietnamese currency, Vietnam Vietnam Vietnam's exports becoming less competitive, therefore Vietnam devalues. Now there are worries in Thailand, in Malaysia, Indonesia, maybe they should devalue as well. And so there is the prospect of a sort of competitive round of devaluations. And in Europe, be, Europe can't devalue, um, but there, uh, this devaluation in East Asia will generate pressures for trade protection in Europe. So the situation right at this minute is very fragile. There's an interesting article in the Financial Times just today by Michael Pettis in Beijing about this very issue but it arises from this fundamental problem that there is no multilateral governance of these kind of things in the world monetary system. And what's more, world global governance, to the extent that there is any, is, is actually weakening. It's not strengthening. And you see this, for example, until 2008, the IMF was on the fast route to irrelevance. Um, it was even f having to fire some of its staff. Something like 500 staff were let go in the, years be the uh, few years before 2008. Um, and the global crisis has been very good news for the IMF. It has resurrected it. The problem is that there's no sign that the uh, states which govern the IMF, that dominate it, um, the G7, the G20, um, have done anything much to redefine its role and its capabilities beyond giving it a, an increase in lending resources um, earlier this uh, year. And you see just how problematic the IMF is as an organization. Uh, there are many indicators, but one of them is the governance shares, the voting shares in which Belgium plus the Netherlands um, each have more than China, India, and all of Sub-Saharan Africa. They each have more than China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And if you put together Belgium, Netherlands, and mighty Luxembourg, mighty <laughs> Luxembourg, you mustn't forget, um, these three great European states have more votes than India, China, and Brazil put together. It's a remarkable state of affairs that it has existed for so long. Um, what about other things? I've talked about the IMF, the G20, of finance ministers formed after the Asian crisis in 1999, well, it's been completely ineffectual. It's been meeting um, ever since 1999, but all through the build-up to this crisis, 
the G20 communiques was saying we need more financial liberalization, more opening of capital accounts, more privatization, the whole uh, Washington consensus or neoliberal agenda, the G20 bought into that almost completely. I have myself been to G20 meetings and it was just toe-curdlingly embarrassing to see how the Australians, the Canadians, and the British, the Americans kind of took a back seat, were just going around corralling all the representatives from developing countries to buy into this sort of hard Washington consensus market liberalization agenda. In other words, the, the central process ha that has been operating in the G20 has been what you could call, in political science terms, hegemonic incorporation of the other states outside the G7 into the G7 agenda and not collectivist cooperation. I, that's a, an overstatement, but largely speaking, that's correct. If you wish, we can come back to the significance of the Financial Stability Forum, or now called the Financial Stability Board, uh, later. Um, and to substantiate my point that it's not just in the financial domain that world governance is eroding, it's also in trade. And um, what is happening is that the WTO is being increasingly bypassed um, as the US and the uh, EU, joined now by Japan and China and others, go outside of the WTO in order to, to establish preferential trade agreements with especially developing countries. China, for example, is the most recent big actor in this game of making preferential trade agreements. China is now negotiating something like 27. And um, now, uh, in fact, more trade is carried out through PTAs than trade carried out under the most favored nation clause. There are something like uh, 400 of these PTAs covering all regions and making a kind of a spaghetti ball of the rules of international trade. The central reason why these PTAs have mushroomed over the 2000s is because of increasing rivalry between the major states. And the favorite, one of the favorite weapons of choice is the preferential trade agreement. That's why they're going outside of the WTO. So the question is why the fall off in support for multilateral economic uh, organizations? One key reason is the reason actually I just alluded to, which has to do with, with these changing power balances between states. Martin also talked about that, especially because of the rise of these major developing countries. And the point is that this changing power balance has intensified the rivalry between the major states. And in response to this intensification of rivalry, the major states are going outside of multilateral fora and negotiating their own deals. That's one main driver. Second main driver is maybe surprising to many of you, as it is to, uh, was to me, the weakening support for globalization in developed countries. And I want to just spell this out a bit. Um, for example, these, uh, these polls, the Financial Times and Harris polls um, uh, of, major, uh, of respondents in major economies ask questions like, globalization has a positive effect in your country, and then they ask respondents to agree or disagree. And the point is that the percentage agreeing with that statement is really pretty low. In the US, the UK, and Spain, it's only 15 to 17%. And of these states, these big states, the maximum is Germany, 36%, agreeing that globalization has a positive effect in your country. And in all six countries, the percentage who said the net effects of globalization were negative in my country um, is greater than the percentage saying that the net effects are positive. Um, whereas in the 1990s, for example, there was considerably more support in the mass public for globalization. And I think one of the consequences of this weakening of support for globalization ideas in the developed countries is that it gives policymakers in the developed countries more latitude to respond in more nationalistic ways to this growing rivalry between the major states, um, more nationalistic ways such as forming um, PTAs and doing nothing much to strengthen global governance in finance. 
Now let me come to the second big driver. Uh, three minutes, four minutes? Uh, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Definitely. Two there is global <laughs> governance here, and it's strong and has an enforcement uh, capacity. So what I want to... <laughs> I want, to show you this I want to show you this surprising argument, and it's so surprising that I may take more than three or four minutes, David. No, we're, we're that, already surprised. Uh, the first point, and the, my argument is that this rising uh, income inequality in the U.S. hobbles its capacity and willingness to exercise leadership in these global forums. So the first thing is to show you this extraordinary chart. This is one of the most important charts you need to know about to understand 20th century history. It shows the share of the top 1% in U.S. national income from 1913 to 2007, 1910 to 2010 up here. And basically, you can see the point. This is excluding capital gains, excluding capital gains. So in 1929, the share was just under 20%. It fell uh, through, the, through, the, through the Depression, Second World War, 1960s, at the time when there were these strong movements in the United States, the labor movement, trade unions, um, the consumer movements, environmental movements, women's movements, and, and uh, the like, these movements were getting legislation passed which substantially um, uh, increased the gains in labor markets of employees as distinct from employers. And so this share of the top 1% fell and fell and fell, stabilized around about 9 or 7%. And then with Reagan and Thatcher, the employers whose, uh, whose ability to appropriate profits had been significantly constrained by these movements, trade unions, for example, women's movements, um, really began to fight back and push through these neoliberal policies or Washington consensus policies. And the results were wonderful for the top 1%. This is what happened to their income share. So it went surging up to reach the same level as in, almost in 1929. So that's the first point. The effects of this massive redistribution of income, there are several kinds of effects that are relevant to the growing financial instability in the US. One was that it tended to fuel asset bubbles because of this concentration of income at the top, which then went into finance. It wasn't consumed. It went into the financial sector. Second thing. The stagnant incomes of the bottom 80% generated discontent on the part of the mass of the public, a discontent which was often directed at this thing called globalization. Um, and that, again, raised the scope for nationalistic responses by political leaders to other states, such as PTAs. And then this is the point I really want to emphasize. This rising any pol polarization of income at the top disables the US polity as a decision-making system. And I, for example, refer you to Clive Crook's recent article in the Financial Times. America, he says, is a polity blinded by rage. In the coming years, the US has enormous challenges to face, such as the trauma of relative decline, and right now its policy looks unfit to cope. So the question is, what is the connection between rising polarization of income and the polity um, disabled as a decision-making system? Well, I'll show you. Rather, this chart shows you. This blue line is the same line as we just saw. This is the share of the top 1% in US income. This red line is an index of political polarization as measured by votes in the House of Representatives right from 1913 all through this period. And basically, the point is, there's a very strong correlation. As the share of income at the top went up and up and up, so political polarization in the US between the main parties increased, and making it more and more difficult for there to be bipartisanship. And so that it has become increasingly difficult for the US polity to make important decisions on anything as a result of this um, increasing political polarization, which is being driven by this rising income inequality. Let me come to some conclusions, David. Now I'll take three or four minutes. Um, Sorry, Mick. I think, uh, we'll cut our speakers down to two now. I think, um, I think nothing much will be done uh, to rein in these engines of financial instability. I don't see major momentum to do anything very much. Therefore, we can expect more crises. 
Um, for example, the, the rivalry between states, which is one of the main drivers, will simply intensify. It won't be reversed. And we won't put in place any kind of multilateral governance mechanism, for example, to coordinate exchange rates. Um, and the current problem with China is a very good example of this. Nor will income redistribution occur. Um, therefore, US political polarization will continue. And that will mean that the US will be unable to exercise leadership in global governance. There are a number of um, specific policy proposals that might be made, some of them uh, easily done, like a global surveillance organization, um, ranging through to replacing the dollar as the, main, uh, as the international reserve currency. That's a step that must be taken but I don't see it likely to be taken in the next 10 years, or if it is, it will be attended by enormous conflict. And if you want to read further, there, here are some references. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Well, that's about the most miserable lecture I've heard in years here at the IOC. Uh, I, I will promise you two things. One, uh, there will be no PowerPoint. And, and two, by the way, David, I don't think I can amuse people this evening. I'm no Zizek or Zuzek. The question we're asking tonight is about global capitalism. All roads concerning global capitalism, I suppose, in the historical sense, lead back to the United States. And Robert touched briefly upon some of those uh, questions towards the end of his uh, excellent presentation. If we think about the United States historically, we can say four pretty obvious things. Firstly, it was the United States, not alone, but it was the United States after World War II that helped rebuild capitalism. It is very difficult to see its recovery after 1945 without the United States and its huge economic and military power. Secondly, it was in some fundamental sense, again, the United States, for good or ill, which helped then defend capitalism, uh, that which we call the Cold War, uh, another word for the defense of capitalism or the defense of the market or free enterprise or the free world over 40 or 50 years. Thirdly, it was the United States, though again, not entirely alone, although it certainly thinks it did it alone, which helped consolidate capitalism, what I call the end of the Cold War, then the victories over, over, over non-market economies between 1989 and uh, 1991. And you could say, fourthly, it was the United States, again, not alone, but it was the central driver in this, David, that helped enlarge and helped enforcement of enlargement of market relations around the world in the, in the 1990s. So there's an obvious connection between uh, the past <laughs> of global capitalism and the particular role played by the United States in the history of capitalism between 1945, when it left the end of World War II and the end of what we call the Cold War and then the enlargement process of capitalism, including China, of course, within that, throughout the 1990s. It's very difficult in that sense to see, to see much of this happening without the United States. In that sense, you know, to paraphrase the former Secretary of State of the United States, it was the indispensable nation in, in, in the sense that I'm meaning it here. Uh, this evening. I think there's also an another connection which is less historical than contemporary, which is there's an obvious connection between what many of us have been talking here about at the LSE and people have been writing about in the Financial Times and elsewhere. There's an obvious connection too between the current crisis of global capitalism and the United States. Um, w without putting it in too simplified terms, you could say that global crisis was made in the, in the United States of America. It was the events unfolding there, first in the subprime market, and then its knock-on effect into the international financial institutions, and then into AIG, Bear Stearns, Goldman Sachs. That's what we were observing throughout the whole period of late 2007 and 2008. It wasn't just an American story. It was a European story as well, but it was a story which was largely about the United States, which ended with that great climactic moment when one of the greatest and probably worst decisions in the history of capitalism was ever made, namely to let Lehman Brothers collapse on that weekend. If you actually read that story, it's an exciting story. It's a page-turner. It's, it's got everything you want. 
without much sex, it has to be said. But nonetheless, it has everything you want. Unintended consequences, people out of control, not knowing exactly what they were doing, and actually thinking that letting Lehman Brothers go would actually stabilize the markets when, of course, it had quite the opposite uh, consequences. And, of course, that crisis made in America, not surprisingly, exported itself elsewhere, thus making it a global crisis of global, of global capitalism. I suppose the difference is that this time around, with, whereas the United States has in the past been very good at getting foreigners to pay for their problems, and indeed foreigners to pick up, pick up the tab, this time the tab is being picked up in the United States in a pretty real and pretty fundamental way. And let me just make two pretty obs one observation. One is the immediate consequence of the crisis. Unemployment is rising, although moment people are telling me it's stabilizing. It is 10%. I've been back and forth to the US since then. I'm going again tomorrow. Hotel rooms, by the way, are much cheaper, thank goodness. Part of the crisis, one of the unintended and positive effects of the crisis, the level of demoralization, the level of political demoralization in the United States, I find, amongst many of my American friends now, is much greater than anything I can ever remember before. This is not just another 1970s. It isn't just another little blip which we saw in 2000 or even at some points in the 50s and 60s. This is, is for real. And this is after trillion dollar bailouts by the state. I think it was again put in the Financial Times, by the way, you keep hearing it quoted here. LSE doesn't have shares in it. Perhaps we should. But nonetheless, there was a wonderful article very, not very long ago. I can't remember the name like uh, Robert can. It said, after all these trillions, is this what we get at the end of the day? You know, 10% unemployment. Okay, some people may be making a lot of money on the stock market, but the real economy, if we can use that phrase, you know, clearly has not recovered, and no, no great recovery in sight. But I think there's a deeper crisis here, a deeper crisis of Americanism. Uh, I think what happened between 2007 and 2008, and nobody in the United States, I think, who is serious, believes otherwise, that this is an ideological crisis of a very profound form. It's not just, as I think Martin correctly said, an, an ideological crisis of neoliberalism. It is a crisis of the American model of capitalism. The idea that markets were the solution, that is no longer believable. The idea that the state is the problem, that is no longer believable any longer. This has been, and I think this is put very well by a former Clinton advisor, Roger Altman, this has been a geostrategic shock for the United States. It can no longer sell the message. It can no longer sell the model around the world. So it isn't just that unemployment levels are still very high, even after trillion dollars of bailout. It is that there's an ideological crisis. America can no longer lead in the same way that it could do, quite frankly, and not only since 1945, but certainly since the last 25 years in this moment of high finance capitalism and uh, neoliberalism. So it's a very profound crisis and one from which uh, the United States clearly is not uh, recovered. Now, what are the global consequences of this going to the second part of the question? Now, this may become the amusing part of it because I thought I'd actually look at the, the writings of one particular person, namely not me, um, but Neil Ferguson. Neil Ferguson, who will be here next year, by the way, uh, as a visiting professor in my own centre, has written long and uh, indeed sometimes correctly, but more often than not, not, uh, on the whole question of the United States. And if you remember, like myself, a few years ago, we were having debates in the same hall about empire. And uh, uh, Neil was kind of making the very strong argument, the problem with the American empire is it doesn't recognize it is one. And what they really need to do is learn from the Brits you know, occupy countries, take them over, run them properly, and give them straight, uh, straight roads and all the rest of it. And his, his main argument against the United States wasn't that it was an empire, but it was an empire in denial. And indeed, on the, on the basis of that, although he now denies that, everybody's denying they supported the Iraq war. It's kind of an interesting kind of people jumping off the ships, like the proverbial, I won't call them rats, but, you know, changing their mind after, after the Iraq uh, disaster. He now claims, of course, that he never really did say these kinds of things, but he did. But what is he saying now? Well, I picked up a nice little article of his uh, just very recently, just published a couple of days ago on this particular problem. And what does Neil say in 2009? Is the empire in the ascendant mode? No, the empire, quote, is at risk. And his argument is really twofold. One is that no empire, or great, great power, if you want to call it that, but no empire as he calls it, is possible on the basis of massive debt. You simply can't be the leading power in the world. You can't be the hegemon in the world to come back to good old Gramscian term and have, used, 
heard Gramsci's name used here for, in anger or dispute for many years, Martin. <coughs> thank you for that. Pleasure. But, you know, you can't be the hegemon while you're, while you're massively in debt. I mean, that's, that's the fundamental argument that he goes into. Not only that, of course, being a good historian, he loves a good historical analogy. And then, therefore, the United States can go the way of all other empires. And hold on to your seats, guys. The precedents are certainly there, says Neil. Habsburg Spain defaulted on all or part of its debt 14 times. I have no idea if that's true. Between 1557 and 1696. And also succumbed to inflation due to a surfeit of New World silver. Pre-revolutionary France was spending 62% of royal revenue on debt service by 1788. Great to be an historian, you use some dates. The Ottoman Empire, here we go, went the same way. Interest payments and amortization rose from 15% of the budget in 1860 to 50% in 1875. And don't forget, and here he gets, he gets a little bit weepy at this moment, and don't forget the last great English-speaking empire. Well, guess which one that was? By the interwar years, interest payments were consuming 44% of the British budget, making it intensely difficult to rearm in the face of the new German threat. And he ends, call it the fatal arithmetic of imperial decline without radical fiscal reform, in other words, massive public cuts. Um, it could apply to America as well. Now, do I agree or disagree with Neil Ferguson? Well, critics of the, the, the new Ferguson thesis, if we can if we can call it that, would, would, I think, say three very quick things. One, firstly, people have predicted American decline before. They've been predicting it since the Vietnam War. Paul Kennedy, who was here a couple of years ago, made, made, you know, sold a hell of a lot of books predicting American decline, and look what happened to the Kennedy thesis. It was proven to be wrong, or so people argued in the 1990s, when we were living in that unipolar moment. One should also say, I suppose, beware historical analogies. Indeed, beware all historians bearing historical analogies, because they may be wrong. It's all very well to talk about the Ottomans, the Habsburgs, and the dear Brits, but maybe these analogies don't work when you're talking about a modern world economy and the modern United States. But maybe the most obvious criticism of the new Ferguson thesis, as I call it, is what about Barack Obama? I mean, after all, how is it that a country which is supposedly in decline, relative or otherwise, Robert, a country which is facing these massive problems can produce a political resurgence, which we have seen over the last year in terms of the standing of the United States. How can it produce a Barack Obama? Isn't this an indication, as many people have argued, that at least the American political system, rather than being the turgid kind of organism that Robert uh, described, is actually an extraordinarily capable system of, re, re, of reaccumulating political now political legitimacy, and that is essentially what Obama has done for the last year. Maybe he shouldn't have got the peace prize, but GW certainly wouldn't have got that peace prize. And again, that may be another indication of something we might call political resurgence in the midst of this apparently um, new conjuncture, which uh, spells the doom of, of, of American power. Well, I have to say that for once, or maybe not for the first time, I'm actually more uh, with Neil Ferguson, and indeed more with Robert Wade, if he wants to be put in the same sentence as Neil Ferguson, I'm not too sure. But I do think there is something about Obama which tells a different story, that I would actually argue that, in fact, if we read Obama differently, if we read the election of Obama last November differently, I think it spells a, a much more problematic story for the United States. First and foremost, he would never have been elected without the financial crisis. Indeed, many would even argue that it needed the collapse of Lehman Brothers in September to bounce the Democrats and, and President, to make Obama into the president. But more than just that, more than that, I would even argue that what we might call the Obama Doctrine, if you want to call it the Obama Doctrine in foreign policy, and I think there is an underlying philosophy there, that underneath all that, underneath the kind of the external form of optimism about, the America, about America and its future, there is, in a sense, a deep pessimism. Um, there's a kind of sense of America adjusting very rapidly to, to a new world order, a world order over which it has much less control and much less, much less capacity for shaping events in directions that it wants to get the outcomes it wants. Now, it may not do an Ottoman, what I say, it won't do an Ottoman. <laughs> it won't do a Habsburg. It may not do a Britain, but there are all the indications of what I call the modern form 
of decline in the United States. It has firstly, and comes back to Martin's very good talk at the beginning, it is clearly desperately seeking to share power with China in some kind of you know, bipolar, new bipolar relationship. It wouldn't have had to do that on the basis of, of genuine power. I mean, many people have criticized President Obama for, for bowing to the Japanese prime minister too low. I mean, you know, I mean, he probably had to bow even lower in private uh, to President Hu Jintao when he met him. Now, this is not the sign of an empire in ascendancy. It's clearly an indication of, of a sharing of power. And, and this, again, is a kind of, it's for me, a synonym for a kind of process of relative decline. Secondly, as we have seen in the debate on Afghanistan, and it does connect to this issue, it does connect to this issue. If we actually listen to what President Obama said yesterday or this morning in the United States about Afghanistan, this was not a self-confident president making a self-confident statement about the future of American policy in, in what is effectively one of the great crucial areas of political concern for the United States for NATO. He's essentially saying, on the one hand, let's put 30,000 more troops in, well, at some point in the future, but let's, by 2011, start bringing them out. Now, I mean, I kind of don't want to go into the whole debate about Afghanistan and the specifics of it, but in terms of the general lessons I draw from that, and if I was leading the Taliban, I know what I'd be saying. By 2011, these guys are going to be leaving anyway. Hold your fire, and we're going to take over the country anyway. And this is, by the way, at a moment when the United States has, will have, within a few months' time, 100,000 ground troops in Afghanistan. And if we add that to the ISAF, some of whom are fighting and some of whom are not, nonetheless, that adds up to the most massive, the most massive political and military intervention by NATO ever, obviously, by, de by definition. This is not the sign of a power in, in control. And, and a defeat in Afghanistan or a withdrawal from Afghanistan would have knock-on effects in terms of credibility and in terms of America's commitment, indeed in terms of allies and their relationship too. The other thing I'd say for is that other states in the world, a great power, an imperial power in the ascendant moment, draws others towards it. Power Ascendant power, confident power, draws others into its orbit. That's what it does. What we are beginning to see, and we're not seeing it in, in a simplistic sense, because we'll still have NATO, we'll still have kind of multilateral organizations meeting, everybody will say the nice words and the right words at the right times and the right places. But I think what we're seeing is that many states in the world are beginning to drift away from the United States. They're not challenging it in any fundamental sense. They're not balancing against the United States, but they're drifting away. They're drifting away. They're not sure of, their, of American guarantees any longer. They're not sure that the leadership the United States provides any longer is the leadership which will get everybody out of this current crisis. And in that sense, if I take China as one indication of the sharing of power, which is one indication of what I call relative decline, if I see the crisis of US policy in Afghanistan as another measure of that, I take one, one, one country in particular, which I think is a significant indicator of what I'm talking about, and that is Turkey. Turkey, after all, has been a significant member of NATO for, for nearly 50 years. It is a critical member in terms of the longer-term relationship of the West with the, what we call the larger Muslim world, whatever that... And what we see in the United States, and here I can quote one fact, I do at least have one, if we actually look at the public opinion polls in Turkey towards the United States, they have not bounced back under Obama. They are still low. In other words, they're reorienting, they're rethinking. They don't get out of NATO. They're not going to balance the United States. But it is a clear indication, I think, of the shape of things to come. Now, what does that mean in very simple terms? And I'll finish in two minutes, David, because I'm more disciplined than the other two. <laughs> Basically, it means, if I might put it in these terms, in hegemonic terms, the historic hegemonic moment is over. In, in the sense which we historically understand the role of a hegemon. And it does have many of the consequences that I think Robert very directly connected with, and by implication, what Martin was also talking about in connection uh, with China. And I, I take many of the things, and I, like Robert, I share some kind of worry about them. I end, however, on, on, on two, two points of what I call absences, the two absences in this. Everybody likes to think in historical analogies, at least Neil Ferguson does. We've always thought in the past that when one great power declines, another one will rise up to take its place. This is the kind of cl classic Anglo-American one. After World War II, Britain was in decline, but however, the superior British, the Greeks, if you could think of them as Greeks, passed on the baton of leadership to these kind of primitive guys we called Americans. They had all the power, we had all the brains. A nice transition took place. 
Um, that, by the way, was a quote from somebody else, not me. <laughs> Please, I'm just the messenger. Um, so don't shoot me. Now, in that, in, that sense, in that sense, it is very difficult to see who the alternative hegemon is. I mean, China may be emerging and rising, as indeed I think Martin has brilliantly pointed out in his book. Nonetheless, I just don't see China or the EU or anybody else ever taking over the kind of multifunctional role that the United States has played historically since the end of World War II and until relatively recently. That's the first absence. It therefore means the world we're moving into is quite unknown. I don't know it, but Robert may be very confident predicting the next few years. I'm not confident about predicting the next 20 minutes <laughs> because I think we are in very unknown territory. We're in extremely unknown territory. It's even going to turn me into a postmodernist if I'm not too careful, but I don't think it'll do that. But I do think we are in, this, in, a, in a world where the boundaries, the knowability of where we are is simply disappearing very, very rapidly. Old historical analogies in some senses don't work. The second, the second absence, of course, is the absence of what I call a progressive alternative to the market. You know, we can bang on about where capitalism is going down the chutes, the terrible things it's doing, the horrible inequalities that Robert illuminated in his, in, in, in his own presentation. But, you know, the, the, cold, the end of the Cold War is playing the biggest historical trick on all of us. You know, it was the collapse of that alternative. Now, however we view the long history of communism or socialism in the 20th century, we can debate that. But the reality is that nobody at the moment is thinking of those alternatives. And if there is not a progressive historical alternative, and I'm not just calling it socialism or communism, but if there is not a progressive historical alternative to where, to where we are now, then all sorts of unpleasant, pathological, and very, very dubious and nasty things could come out of the woodwork. They could be nationalism, they could be increasing forms of, of anti-immigrant feeling, they could be all sorts of things which could come out. So the decline, the relative decline, of the United States, as, I, as I've argued here this evening. It may be welcomed by some, and I'm sure many people in some parts of the world are rubbing their hands and thinking this is the best thing that's happened since Margaret Thatcher, if that's the right way to put it, or the worst thing since Margaret Thatcher. But nonetheless, there's no inevitability that the consequences and the outcomes of an American relative decline in this era will have some of the consequences that many of us would like. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, um, a finally uh, complementary set of contributions, which uh, brings out in me the determination to uh, disagree with them in a moment. But before I do, um, uh, I think we, uh, we, we don't have time for you to, to really, the three of you, to, to comment on each other's contributions. And I think it's not really necessary because, in a sense, you're, there is a high degree of overlap and a high degree of complementarity in the narratives that you are setting out. So because we need to finish at 8, and that's only 20 minutes, let's start straight away with questions. Take them in. I think we'll take, a, a, should we take 10? Because there's enough of you to cover the bases, just to get them out. Because I like the audience to have a chance to say what's on their mind. And because we're short of time, I think we just, let's get out some issues on the table from you. Yeah, um, let's, let's the mic over here, but we'll spread the mic around. Can I ask the panel, is it representative democracy that's in crisis? Each of you, I think, have alluded to parts of that, and uh, I think it might be relevant, okay. slightly different in, in each area. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's kind of there with a moustache. Is there a mic, is there a mic coming to you? Upstairs. Sorry, do I ask it now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's very interesting. I think it was Professor Michael Cox mentioned the New World Order, a term used by Brzezinski. Kissinger, George Bush 1, George Bush 2, and recently Gordon Brown. Um, also, I think one of you also talked about the, the, growing, the growing amount of money that the top 1% has. And so one of you said that the Iraq war, Iraq war and Afghanistan war is a disaster. It's obviously not a disaster for the people at the very top. And um, thirdly, um, looking at these signs, um, are you optimistic or pessimistic for the common man on the street? And if you're pessimistic, do you feel, as Gerald Salente says, there will be revolution in America? And I mean armed wow. revolution. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> From the right. Yeah. Um, yeah, guy at the back. Yeah, we'll come to you in a minute. You got a mic? Who is it? Yeah. Hi. Thank you for your talk. I was wondering on the lack of uh, regulation and the governance issue, do you think. Um, it is maybe an issue that often we have the same people in regulatory bodies, such as the FSA, uh, intellectual and 
teaching institutions and uh, banking institutions. Do you think that's an issue or is, is it just irrelevant maybe? Thank you. Thank you. Yep, at the back. Yeah, w wouldn't you agree that one of the main reasons for American de demoralization is the extraordinary way that Obama, during the campaign, raised expectations to ridiculous heights, <laughs> way beyond what he could actually realize? And now what the American people have seen is gridlock in Congress over health care reform, gridlock on financial regulation, and him having to say that if he's going to give 30,000 more troops to uh, in Afghanistan, he's going to have to withdraw by mid-2011, otherwise the Democratic caucus would not support him. I mean, basically, he's hidebound by his own party. He may wish, in fact, for it to lose in the midterm elections. Okay, now, that's a lot of boys to having spoken. Yes, great, I've got the mic. <laughs> um, would, uh, to Michael Cox, uh, would you not agree that there's a third way developing in South America in terms of socialism? Okay, uh, yep, guy at the back. Hi there, um, do you think global capitalism is worth fixing, is worth saving? <laughs> yes. Why should we be so concerned with American inequality when inequality in China is already higher and rising, and China points more towards where we're going as opposed to where we have been. Yeah, anybody else want to take that? Yes, please. Yeah, we've all been very disappointed with uh, New Labour, but uh, take an example of the UK and the US. Would the speakers uh, comment on why the, uh, the, the financial leaders of the West, particularly UK and America, probably the best examples, have responded to the financial crisis in such a, shall we say, incompetent way, and why they haven't taken the opportunity to perhaps put into effect many of the uh, controls and regulations and new systems, more communal systems, more socialist systems, that perhaps was a unique opportunity, because many people said this was a unique opportunity to sort of turn back the tide of history and put into effect all the wishes of Harold Wilson and others. Uh, so I'd like to see whether, the real question is, why hasn't this happened? Is it systemic or purely ignorance? Okay, we're on a, uh, on a roll here. Um, I'm about anyone else before we go back to uh, me, actually? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay, okay, no one are bursting to ask a question. Let me, let me just ask a big point. I mean, one of the points I take from what you're all saying is that, in a sense, that there is a profound and growing crisis of global governance at a time of the greatest, in a sense, global threats. I mean, I think that <clears throat> yeah, Robert's comments on the weakening American commitment to um, multilateralism links you know, powerfully to uh, Martin Jakes's comments about the rise of Asia as well. The rise of China links powerfully to your comments about the absence of a sort of future hegemon. And as I, as I see it, you know, the 1945 multilateral order is fragmenting just at the time, in a sense, partly driven by the war on terror, which I think partly smashed it, actually, uh, somewhat deliberately uh, uh, and also uh, unintentionally, but a mixture of both, mm -hmm. at a time when we have a changing balance of power across the world and the emergence of these sets of issues, nuclear proliferation, climate change, financial market regulation, multilateral tr future multilateral trading order, resource scarcity. So at precisely the time you get the accumulation and confluence of these massive systemic buildup of global issues, the, the governance system is, global governance system is its weakest, the 45 settlement is not fit for purpose, and we do not see an alternative, either hegemon or systematic rule framework emerging in that context. And what the story that I think uh, uh, was told today by Robert about the absence of commitment in the US you know, to financial market reform, of course, is mirrored in climate change and mm -hmm. elsewhere. Uh, but let me just, just ask you one more skeptical, and I agree with all of that, I think, and it's very profound and deeply worrying. Um, and I think in the next five years, we will see where it will go, because around nuclear proliferation, financial market regulation, and climate change are three to four crucial tests around which we will know the answer to the following question. Is a new form of governance system capable of merging 
a new paradigm around climate change, let us say, which then might be an example to others. But let me just take a, the issue of the U.S. in a minute. You've all spoken in a sense of U.S. relative decline. We've heard this often before. It reminded me very much of a lecture that Antti Giddens used to give to former director of the LSC, but used to give in Cambridge when he was a professor there, on the, the don'ts of sociology. Don't overgeneralize from one moment. Don't overgeneralize in one time period. Don't overgeneralize an experience of one country. Well, you've, always, you've all provided powerful reasons why we should actually think of, of deep tr trends in this particular case. But the US, it's also true about the US. It's a hugely dynamic society. It has enormous recuperative powers. The fact that Obama followed Bush was something no one three years ago uh, would have predicted. Many of the crucial sciences that will determine the future of the world economy are embedded in American universities. The IT revolution, robotics, artificial intelligence, the biosciences, genetic research, nanotechnology space, all these are locked in there. And they are, in some senses, the future drivers of the world economy and the next generation of, of, of economic innovation. The US has got huge financial reserves to push into these things. So it might be, of course, this is a huge period of adopt, adaptation for the United States, but it's capable of that adaption when its competitors like China have become successful because of low cost labor, which is bound to run in some sense into the buffers at some point. India, while having rich in you know, software engineers and sciences too, is a highly uh, um, complex state structure, which isn't necessarily competitive in the world terms, and so on and so forth. Could, I'm just raising this now because an alternative narrative not being set out. Doesn't this suggest that what we might be seeing is a period of a dec two or th three decades of adaptation, but actually we don't yet know what will emerge from that? Sorry, I just thought I would say that. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I, I'd love you to respond. We all want to hear what you have to say. So why don't you take five minutes each to wrap up and pick up the issues you want to pick up on and uh, draw us to a conclusion. So let's we start with Martin. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I wanted to respond um, to uh, what David said, but it seems to me this is a wider question that's been raised, which is uh, the era we're living in now. Um, and, the, and the sources of the instability. And it seems to me that the, the fundamental source of the instability is that the United States is no longer able to support the international system in all its various forms and institutions that it gave birth to at the end of the Second World War. Mm, and this is, a, this is a secular trend. The United States will not be able to deal with that. Uh, in fact, we already see because we were blind to it for 10 years during the, the Bush period and so on, that actually it's gone much further than we understand. And if you want to see an example of this, it is the decline in the American position in East Asia and the extent to which alternative institutions are in the process of being created. The classic example is the bilateral trade agreements, uh, which, uh, um, uh, you, Robert, sorry, which Robert uh, was referring to. Um, and this, is, this seems to me to be the kernel. And the, this is the reason why we are in for a long underlying period of instability, because while that is the case, there are no stable forms of global governments. How can there be? Because everything is shifting. Everything is uh, unstable. The United States doesn't know how to deal with the situation that it's now in, um, which is in a way what Obama's uh, uh, philosophy is. He understands that America can't be like it was uh, you know, in the dreamboat period of Bush, but he doesn't know what it is, and so he's making it up as he, as he goes along. And actually, the United States is in a state of shock. It's in a state of shock, because at the beginning of the Bush era, it thought it was in a different world. It thought it was on, you know, the eve of a new American century. So it's totally unprepared for decline, totally unprepared to think about uh, its new situation. And I, in my view, that's politically dangerous, uh, because um, it's coming, it's, it, it results in serious disorientation, dislocation, uh, and, and potentially, uh, you know, anger uh, and rage. It is certainly true that there is no uh, alternative hege hegemon in sight. But, you know, that's not a new, new situation. I mean, excuse me, but when Britain 
but it lost its role in 1931. Finally, after trying desperately to hang on to it ever, uh, at the end of the First World War, there was not an immediate solution. In fact, the solution only arrived at the end of the Second World War when the United States was in a position to be and was prepared to assume that role. Now, in my view, the position is much more serious now because there is, I think, the, 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 there'll be new forms. It won't be as simple as it was then, but the key country is going to be China. But China is not in the same state as any of these other countries that we've previously discussed since the beginning of the industrialized era. China is a developing country as well as a developed society, a, a, a primarily a developing country. And so it's not in a position and shouldn't be in a position to assume the kind of role that the United Sta States uh, has had. Um, the, uh, the second... Uh, um, so, uh, David asked the question, is a new global system capable of emerging? Of course not. I mean, it seems to me there'll be elements of a new system, but it's going to take quite a long period, because how does it emerge in a situation where uh, we're moving out of American era and we're not able to have a, a stable form in that situation? The world is changing too quickly. There are too many rivalries. There are too many conflicts uh, uh, in many different spheres and in many different forms. The other point I want to make is, um, is uh, the question, because I haven't got time to do all of it, but the question about is rep representative democracy in crisis, and linking to your point, it seems to me, about uh, why have the re economic responses in the United States and the UK to the crisis been so inadequate? Well, I don't think in the first instance it's a crisis of representative democracy. I don't think in the first in instance that is the case. I think in the first instance, what it is, is a situation where there's a big crisis, no one is familiar with it, no one knows quite what to do with it, there was no intellectual preparation for it, there's a major paradigm shift taking place, and, um, and so therefore they're making it up as they go along, trapped within the parameters of their old thinking. And that seems to me to describe the kind of Western problem as particularly when it comes to the global financial crisis. Now, of course, the implication of that can be that it, it brings into, into question uh, the form of the system. I mean, that always can happen under these circumstances, as it happened, of course, in the interwar period. So it can become a crisis of representative democracy. And the logjam that um, Robert was talking about uh, in terms of the United States and the ineffective state and so on, is a good example uh, 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 of this kind of problem. And the rise of China will raise new questions in this context, not just in simply, you know, well, it's authoritarian and so on, but in my view, the state form and the relationship between the state form and China and Chinese society is different. Legitimacy does not reside in the people, never has, in my opinion, never will in a Western-style form because of the way the state is constructed. So we're moving, you know, at the, be the question at the beginning uh, that I didn't realize was capitalism convergence or divergent. I think we're moving into a very divergent period. Okay, just a few, very few points. Representative democracy in crisis, just one point. Um, yes, because um, media, serious media, uh, newspapers, um, quality newspapers, are simply not viable if they're run by profit-maximizing companies. We have to find quite new forms of corporate organization to sustain serious media like, uh, well, the ones that you know and love. Um, Low-profit forms of limited liability corporations. Um, we should be pushing much harder to form these new forms of uh, corporations that are not uh, are neither profit maximizing nor non profits, but are low profits. Um, and there are some promising developments in the United States of this kind. I don't see the survival of a serious media without uh, changes of this, without these new forms of corporate organization, low profit forms coming as the providers of them. <coughs> Second point um, there's been a uh, talk here about the, the new era launched by Obama, the rejuvenation of the American polity symbolized by Obama. I have to slightly disagree, and it relates to a couple of questions uh, to do with the uh, response to the financial crisis, um, not at all social democratic. And the point here is that Obama has uh, continued um, 
the situation that existed in the Bush government, where there was what Simon Johnson calls a quiet coup, a quiet coup of Wall Street over the US Treasury. But Obama has brought in people who were architects of the very regime that produced the bubble that has now gone into crisis, and they're being asked to fix it. Timothy Geithner, Larry Summers, for example, um, so that very little change has happened in this key part of the U.S. government uh, has been brought in by uh, Obama. It's functioning just as it was in the Bush administration. And the third and last point, I just want to take up something David said. David presented this picture of the U.S. as the very epicenter of global technological innovation. And I think there's a large amount of truth in that. But the other side of that is that the U.S. Uh, government, U.S. firms are trying very, very hard to lock in their technology rents using intellectual property protection, uh, using things like the TRIPS agreement in the WTO, using agreements in the preferential trade agreements to do with intellectual property. property. One of the, just one of the many bad consequences of this is that U.S. firms are strongly resisting the idea of transferring technology to developing countries uh, which would be used for combating climate change. So that the climate change agenda is being hindered by the fact that a lot of the technologies are developed in the U.S. but are then being protected by intellectual uh, property rights. Okay, David, thanks. Um, <clears throat> let me pick up your, your, your point, David, about your counterpoint really about taking from Tony Giddens, you know, d don't project from the immediate situation, you know, in a few years time things could have changed. You said 10 to 20 years, that's a hell of a long time. Um, and it, it could well be, it could well be. I mean, you know, I mean, <coughs> in, in my presentation, I didn't go into all the kind of obvious ind indicators of, of American strength. I mean, it still spends rest, more than the rest of the world put together on national security. This is not insignificant. Um, it still is a key player in regional alliances around the world, in Asia and in Europe. I mean, it is still there. Um, it still can put 100,000 troops on the ground in Afghanistan, whatever the, whatever the outcomes will be. Um, you know, it has the, has the universities you talked about, although many of those are in deep crisis, by the way, because of the fiscal crisis. So I, I pick up on all, all your points there, David, and in some ways, you know, the United States, as somebody who's not, never been known for anti-Americanism myself, is in, in some ways a deeply attractive society. I mean, it has absorbed millions of immigrants into the society. It has it is, it is, it is given chances and opportunities. So I, I kind of take that point. And maybe, in, in a way, you know, I, I'm still rather soft on the United States, in spite of what I said at the end. I'm also still, by the way, Robert, rather soft on Obama. Sorry. Um, it may well be that he's taken on the same economic team, uh, some you mentioned, plus, but by the way, of course, the chief Fed head of the Fed, Bernanke. However, I still prefer Obama being in the White House than the last geezer. You know, I'm sorry. I mean, I don't want to be too ultra-left on this, but I actually do like somebody who talks about health care reform. Um, I do like somebody who kind of talks about diplomacy. I do want somebody who kind of makes spe the kind of speeches that he made in Cairo, uh, whatever the, some of the intellectual flaws in that speech were on the question of the relation of the Muslim world. I like a guy who kind of says, let's try and do some diplomatic deals with some of the guys we don't like, like Russia and Iran. I do like a guy who can make the kind of speeches he made at the UN. I mean, go back and read that speech which he made at the UN. I mean, this is a pretty remarkable guy. I also... This is just talk. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. I also judge a person by his enemies. Always know a person by his enemies. Look who hates him. As soon as I find out who hates Obama, I like Obama. You know, Fox News doesn't like him. All the other guys around the world don't like him. Sorry, I'm a rather crude old politico. I kind of judge people by their enemies as well. So I take your point on the economics. Okay, you stuck on the economics. You're very good. But, you know, look, you've got to try to take the wider political thing. Now, has he raised expectations too high? Now, I've heard this stuff time and time again. He's raised expectations. But, my goodness, we needed some raising of expectations back last year. I mean, you know, I mean, it was pretty miserable. I mean, we were, we were staring into the Second World Depression. Um, we were looking over the edge of an abyss. And we were told by many people who looked at the 2004 election results that America was Bush. Well, we were told something rather different last year. 
And this kind of did give me a little, I'm sorry again, it may be my kind of old leftism coming out here, you know, my kind of hope for change, hope for possibility. And this kind of gave me a little bit of a lift. And that lift is, 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 is still there. He has raised the expectation. But that's exactly what a political leader should do. I mean, what's the point of giving 70 million, people, 70 million votes to a guy saying, now depress my expectations? <laughs> You know, this is not what political, political people should do. And of course, by raising expectations, of course, there's going to be disappointment and disillusion. But at least we've got something to judge him by. And we, we, it is, it is still a long way to play on this. There's still a long way to play on this. Um, so anyway, there's some kind of differences of opinion on that. Let me just pick up two, two quick points. Is it worth saving? Great question. As a kind of an old trot, I suppose I should say, years back. No, of course not. Let's wait for the crisis. And then, you know, but the question is, and Martin Martin, of course, came from a different political tradition, uh, on the left anyway. Um, well, is it worth saving in its current form? No. I mean, the form that Robert described, it's certainly not worth saving. You know, a, a system that produces those vast inequalities between states within states, increasing inequalities between states, is that form worth saving? No. I mean, nobody should go out on the barricades and try and defend that kind of system. Um, is some social democratic form of it with greater redistribution, which are the, the problems of which are huge, is that worth fighting for? Yes. Yeah. If there was the big, or if there was the big story, the bumper sticker, you know, like the SWP has outside every now and then, you know, you know, capitalism is over, socialism is the next. Well, I'd love it to be so. Maybe in the heart of my deep old lefty heart, maybe. <laughs> But it ain't going to happen at the moment. It ain't going to happen at the moment. I'm afraid the whole history of Stalinism in the 20th century has turned millions and millions and millions of people away from that kind of thinking about the alternative. You know, good old Joe Stalin and his friends around the world did more for capitalism than anybody else in the world, in my opinion. So, you know, and we are still living with that legacy. We are still living with that legacy. And until we can, in real terms, construct what I would call a realistic utopia, as opposed to one that produced repression, inefficiencies, and the rest. Until we can produce that realistic utopia, then I'm afraid we've got to stick with something, not the current system, but something in the future. One final point, is there going to be armed revolution in the United States? No. Um, <laughs> but this does raise a very interesting question, it does seem to me. Um, if what I'm saying is true, which I think it, broadly speaking, may well be, I hope it is, because I said it, um, <laughs> If the kinds of so social hopelessness, which may last for a long time, continue and deepen, if the kind of economic opportunities which ordinary working middle class people have been looking forward for the last 20 years are not getting them, then, th then this is going to have some pretty unpleasant consequences for the social and political and cultural fabric of the United States of America. I mean, after all, in the 1990s, when we had good old Bill Clinton running the place, you know, imperfectly, but he ran it, I thought, better, better than the guy before him, um, then we did have unemployment levels coming down. We got crime levels coming down. We had ethnic minorities getting economic opportunities. We saw the great, the great growth and the developments of American universities. We did see some hope on the, on the basis of what was happening. Now, you know, it is easy to say the worse it gets, the better. I'm sorry, I don't believe that. You know, I just, I'm not into that kind of game, partly because I've got a pension to pick up in a few years' time, but also because I kind of genuinely care for humanity. And the worse it gets, isn't the better. The worst it gets is not the better. Uh, but I do think we can see what I called at the end of my talk, you know, kind of forms of, you know, forms of pathologies, you know, whether in terms of violence between ordinary human beings. We may see a growth in the prison population. We may see an increase in the demand for drugs on our streets. We will see all the kinds of social pathologies we've seen in the, de the developing and the underdeveloped countries. Uh, Robert wrote a wonderful piece where he said that next year, I think you used the figure 40, mil 40 million more people, I think, even just in sub-Saharan Africa, are going to descend even from that pathetic level of $2 a day down into $1 a day. So those are the kinds of pathologies we've got to worry about. And in the absence of, a, as I say, going back to what I said at the very end of my talk, David, of a, of a genuine alternative, which has a political which has a political leadership, not just a bunch of intellectuals talking on a stage at the LSE, but can express itself for a political party, a political organisation, then we're just still going to be in some deep trouble. Mm. Well, having come from a generation that advocated sex, drugs and rock and roll, I'm not but sure never about... never had any of it, but, but, <laughs> but, but, but I'm not sure about some of your pathologies. <laughs> However, we, we, we can clearly see in these three, I thought, you know, outstanding complementary uh, presentations uh, gr a growing dr drift towards greater uncertainty and risk in global politics mm -hmm. with a relative economic decline in the United States, the relative rise of Asia, the breakup of the 1945 multilateral 
settlement driven by many of the mechanisms that I think that Robert uh, uh, brilliantly highlighted. And I, I, all this means that the pressure on global governance comes at exactly the time when the systemic buildup of problems created by globalization, climate change and so on and so forth, are at their most and becoming at their most acute. And this doesn't look pretty. It looks extremely risk-laden and uncertain. And I think there we just have to watch what happens now at Copenhagen, the, the attempt to renew the non-proliferation treaty in 2010, sure. and the future of greater financial market regulation, never mind multilateral trade rules. There are all the tests we need, and they're not in 10 years' time, they're now, in the next few years. And that will determine the break, the shape of governance at the global level, I think, for decades to come. And there, I think, we need to be optimistic, we need to be champions of alternative visions and alternative progressive visions, because the old political agenda has run its course. The Washington Consensus, American <coughs> unilateral moment, has run its course. But can we be opti we can be, should be optimistic, and we should fight that corner, but can we really dare hope that the alternative will win out? It's at least a serious question. So it remains to me to thank you all very much. A great evening, another great LSE evening, very stimulating. Thank you for your contribution.